The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hey Felix, how are the single-handed controllers coming? Yeah Ben, I'm probably two-thirds of the way through this right-handed controller. We've got three of them that we need to make two rights and two lefts. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I started building single-handed controllers for accessibility like almost 10 years ago. And recently, Felix has been building them all after I trained him how to do it. Yeah, I pretty much do most of the orders. We, we've made about 80 of them this, well, probably 70 something this year. Quite a few this year alone. Yeah. But what I thought might be cool is to do an episode where we show you, the viewers, how you can perform your own mods on controllers. It's actually pretty straightforward. The main challenge is the time it takes. You know, you have to go in there, solder carefully. But we thought we would give you the tips you need in order to accomplish your own mods, along with pinouts and diagrams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we usually just do a standard set up for the left, set up for the right. But we could show you how to maybe make a controller the way you want it, and then you could pwn some noobs, so to say. Oh yeah, have buttons on the back for fast access, swap the analog stick with the D-pad, change mm -hmm. the triggers, anything you wanted. Yeah, well, so we'll get the pinouts for everything and then we can put it up on GitHub. That way you can learn how to make your own mods. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bad them hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. In today's episode, we're going to show you how to modify video game controllers for specialized use. Here are the steps. Button remapping, putting the face buttons anywhere you want on the controller, such as the back, for fast action, like the Xbox Elite controller. Directional pad changes or swaps, you can also move the directional pad around, or use specialized tack switches to replace it entirely. Moving the analog sticks, perhaps you want to swap them around, put one on the back, change the position slightly, we'll show you how to do it. And finally, working with the analog triggers, there's two types of analog triggers in video game consoles. There's mechanical potentiometer versions and also ones that use magnets and Hall effect sensors. We'll show you how to modify both. Let's get started. So Felix and I have been modifying video game controllers for accessibility for a while now. Yes. Felix has learned all about it. Mm -hmm. And he's also learned that the PlayStation 4 controller is incredibly hard to mod, unfortunately. They use Very a different. silk screen circuit that you can't solder to. However, if you want to mod, I would highly suggest either the Xbox One or the Xbox 360 controller. So those are the ones we're gonna cover today. All right, shall Great. we start? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we take off the battery cover, and then I got this uh, tool kit from iFixit. It's pretty handy, it's got a lot of security bits. So the security bit will look like a star or a hex bit, but then it'll have a little hole in the middle to fit the pin that's on the security screw. So yeah, this part you kinda need fingernails for, right? That is the most difficult part for me. Uh, uh, I hate that part. Yeah, I always feel like you're gonna break off your fingernails. Now, if you see a sticker on something that says warranty void if removed, that points you to exactly where a screw is. That's where you start. Yes. All right. Now I'm gonna get my security bit. So these iFixit kits, I think they're like, what, about $20? They're, if you're into hacking or modding at all, they're very useful, I'd highly suggest it. They don't have any tri-wing security screws though, which is a little weird. As we take off the back shell, we want to note that these um, battery connectors slide into the plastic. See that? So when you put it back together, you have to make sure that you don't accidentally cover them up. You have to actually make sure they slide back in correctly. And also when you put it back together, if you just put it in like this, you will hit these magnets here. So you have to push in the trigger slightly so that they fit. So in the Xbox 360, they had connectors for the rumble motors, but connectors cost money. So obviously they're gone now, saving half a cent. But you know, you multiply that by 10 million and it adds up. So before we continue, we're gonna have to manually desolder these. So there's the main rumble motors and then there's rumble motors in the triggers as well for some reason. And that's the gray and black wire. And on the, not that it really matters to the motor, but on the circuit board, you can see positive and negative. So you'll know where to hook them back up when you're done. Okay, and you wanna yep. do that real quick? Mm -hmm. Thanks for desoldering those wires, Felix. Oh yeah, it was a lot of work. No, it wasn't. <laughs> So the rumble motors may fall out at this point, so we'll just pull them out. The rule of thumb is 
large motor left L. That's how I think of it. Every game controller has the large rumble motor on the left. I wonder why. So this kind of has a Darth Vader thing in front of it, you know, like help me take this mask off. All right, with the screws removed, we can pull this section off. Okay, so you might be wondering, why are there two circuit boards inside of this controller? Well, if you remember, the Xbox 360 controller had an absolutely horrible D-pad. Why was it horrible? Well, because the D-pad was rotating on a shaft that is the same height as the analog stick. So there's a single circuit board in here, and you've got this big cylindrical thing here, and that's why it's so mushy, right? For better action, you need to have the D-pad switches right under the D-pad. So on the new controller, that's what they did. They actually have a front section here with the circuit board. You get these really nice clicks, although it's kind of a cheapy dome switch, which is exactly what they use in the Atari 2600 controller. So this part, we don't necessarily need to change it, but I'm just gonna show you what's inside of it. This you have to be a little more careful with, as Felix has probably discovered. Yes, yeah, so let's take it apart. Yeah. All right, so with the screws removed, you have to kind of slide it out from this front section here. So you pull it up, then you twist it a little bit. Something else a little weird in this controller is the B button is actually on a different plane. All right, that's what it looks like inside the controller. Yeah, look at that. So they have two stages here. Basically, you know, the main reason they did this was to give responsive touch to the D-pad. And then these are just little metal domes. So eventually these will wear out. Sorry, Microsoft, but they will. Everything will wear out eventually, except for VW bugs. Then these are going to be your shoulder buttons. Now the thing that's really nice about this controller as far as modding goes, is that because it's modular, most of the connections that you need to get at are going to be on these headers here, right? In fact, the only thing that isn't on the headers are the analog sticks and the B button since it's separated. But there's a non-populated diode under the B button because anything they don't have to populate, they don't because it might save a billionth of a cent. So you can actually get the um, B button signal right off of that already tinned solder pad. This is probably the easiest controller to mod in modern gaming. It's easier than this by a long shot. Okay, now that we have the controller apart, we're going to show you how to modify buttons. So the button moving mod that I'm going to do is to put the four face buttons on the back of the controller, just like the Xbox Elite controller, but for a much cheaper price. The reason that someone might want buttons back there is because if you're playing a shooter game or something fast action, you might not want to take your thumbs off of the control sticks, but you also need to push one of the face buttons in order to execute an action like reload, jump, knife someone. So if you put those buttons back here, you basically don't have to move your thumb. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark off some spots using the marker, it's kind of redundant. Now I have a little concern here is intersecting with the rumble motors, but I think we'll be all right. Another great thing about this Xbox One controller is there's just so much empty space inside of it. Even compared to the Xbox 360 controller, which means you have plenty of room to run wires, add switches, whatever you want. I'm sure that wasn't a deliberate design choice on their part, but the fact remains, it's a very easy controller to mod. You know, I've never accidentally drilled into myself. I love tack switches because they're easy to use and you can definitely hear them working. So I'm gonna put a couple tack switches in here and we're gonna use this for our new buttons. Now, another thing that's really good about the Xbox 360 and Xbox One controller is that they have very simple uh, button schematics. There's basically a signal going to each button and then the other side of the button goes to ground. So when you push the button, it completes the circuit to ground, pulling the signal low. Very, very simple. Other controllers have matrices in them. I don't know why. PlayStation 3 controller, all the buttons are analog. I don't know why, um, but if you want to mod something, Xbox is by far the easiest. I actually personally have a PlayStation 4, but I try to be controller agnostic. All right, while the glue cools, I'm going to wire up the buttons. So as I mentioned, there's a common ground, which means we can wire two of these switches directly together and then just get the signals off of the opposite buttons. Using hot glue, I hold the tack switches in place. Then I wire up three wires to each side, two signals and one ground. Now that we have the wires attached to the switches, we're going to attach them to the headers. I have a pinout here of what is on each header, and we will have this online for you to download if you want to do your own mods to the Xbox 
one controller. I'll get a ground signal just by scratching off this outer plane. There we go. That will be ground, right as rain. All right, so let's see. Uh, these buttons, the lower one is A and the upper one is B. As I mentioned before, the B isn't on the header because the B button is on this particular panel. So I'm just gonna put a little solder on this unpopulated diode and I'm going to do the really cheap wire stripping of heating up the wire and allowing the plastic to contract. It's cheap, but it works. I'm just gonna attach that right to the pad. There we go. Okay, that's the B button. Not a bad idea to put a little bit of, that's right, hot glue on it to act as a strain relief. So if the wire gets pulled, it pulls on the hot glue, not the solder joint. Okay, and that leaves the A button, which is four over from the right, or four from the left. I guess it's basically in the center, isn't it? Well met. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of solder to this pin, and there's gonna be another button here as well. And I'm gonna snip this a little shorter, happy little clouds. Okay, so there's the A and the B button connected. Now we need to do Y and X. So again, you know, we can take advantage of the fact there's quite a bit of room, even the D-pad. The D-pad presses against this circuit board, so there's basically nothing here. It's wide open, so we can easily run our wire over through here, like that, and then we'll bring it over to this. So I'm going to snip it a little longer than it needs to be, never a bad idea. It's easier to tuck wires in that are too long than it is to extend wires that are too short. Now, I can push the buttons from the back. Oh yeah, elite skills. Let's test it out. All right, I've plugged the controller into my PC. This is a really good way to test it. I'm gonna go to devices and printers and Windows 7 should have the drivers. All right, there it is. Let's take a look. All right, A, B, X, Y appears as buttons one, two, three, four in Windows. So we should also be able to go one, two, three, four. All right. Our replaced buttons on the back of the controller are ready to rock. Super elite. It's time for a tech timeout. Before we move on to the analog sticks and the analog triggers, we should talk about potentiometers and Hall effect sensors. So potentiometer is basically a variable resistor. Its electronic symbol looks like this. It's a resistor with an arrow pointed into it. And in the case of these controllers, one tap of it is connected to voltage of some kind, usually 3.3 volts or sometimes five. The other side is usually almost always going to ground. And what the sense does is it basically sees what voltage that the potentiometer is at. So the closer you get to VCC, the higher the voltage, the closer you get to ground, the lower the voltage, and that gives you an analog reading. That analog reading, of course, will be turned into a digital signal or a digital number, but at this point, it's actually an analog voltage. It goes from you know five to zero or whatever the range is. And that's how you know how far the stick has moved. Now, Hall effect sensor is used in things like the Xbox One triggers, and it was also used in the Dreamcast controller for all the analog sticks. Um, Electrically, it works kind of the same way. You power the Hall effect sensor and you put ground into it because it's actually an integrated circuit, but it actually detects the proximity of a magnetic field. So however close or far the magnet is from the sensor will change the voltage. And the voltage again will range from your VCC to your ground. So you're still getting an analog value out of it, but it's being created in a different way. So these are the two types of variable resistors we will see when we're working with analog sticks and triggers. The next thing I'm going to work with are the analog sticks. As we mentioned on the whiteboard, the analog sticks are built from potentiometers. Take a look here, you can see these teal things on the side. Those are two potentiometers for X and Y. So let's desolder the controller and take a closer look at those. 
and then I'll show you how to move them where you want them to go. So each potentiometer has three pins, got two ends, and then the middle one, which is usually called the wiper. So if a potentiometer is rated at 10K, for instance, you can get that value by reading it from the ends because you're basically reading the total resistance of the potentiometer. Let me just boot this up and let's see. I'm gonna guess these are 10. Uh, no, hmm, they're like 2.5. Although there may be other things in the circuit affecting the value. So to get the correct value or to just to make sure it's correct, it's best to remove them. So there's going to be the potentiometers that have three pins each, plus these uh, metal tabs, which basically add structure, plus the button that clicks in and out or the L3, R3 button, as it's usually called in gaming. And we'll have to remove all of these. So I'm gonna add a little solder to make it a little easier to remove. Then I will use my solder sucker from Element 14 to remove the solder. Okay, now that it's desoldered, it comes right out. Now that it's removed from the circuit, I'm going to check the value of it again. Okay, yeah, there is a, it's a 10K potentiometer. That's pretty common for these controllers. Again, if it's connected to the circuit and you try to get a reading of its resistance, it may be erroneous because of other things in the circuit. Okay, so basically on this, we have the two potentiometers, and then we have the posts, and this is the tack switch here. So if you want to rewire this, you don't have to rewire everything. Um, you just need one ground, and the ground would be common between this, this, and here, then positive voltage, which would be just tying two of these together, and then two individual wipes. So you can actually get the whole analog stick with just four wires. Signal, signal, voltage, ground, and then I guess five if you include the clicky button. So I'm gonna combine this along with another part of the episode, which is to move the D-pad. Maybe you wanna make your Xbox One controller just like the PlayStation 4 controller. Why, I don't know, but let's say you wanted to do that. So again, this is just a piece of plastic that presses on these metal tabs here. So what we could do is actually put the analog stick in its place. I'll use an X-Acto knife to score some lines around these tabs to cut out a circular section where the D-pad used to be. Then I will desolder the analog stick and rewire it to ribbon cable so we can put it someplace else. We're going to hot glue it in place where the D-pad was and then connect the ribbon cable directly to the circuit board to recreate the circuit. Now I've got the two analog sticks in the same plane, just like the PlayStation 4. And I can go into my properties here and see that yes, the reposition analog stick is working. All right, so another controller mod finished. The last thing we're gonna talk about are the analog triggers in all of the modern game consoles. So I'm gonna use the Xbox 360 as an example. There's a reason for that, which you'll see soon. There's a lot more structure inside of this controller. See all these standoffs? So it was harder to mod. There just wasn't as much room, but it's a simple one board construction. If you look at the uh, D-pad here, yeah, look how thick it is, look at that. So that whole piece having to rotate was why it was such a crappy D-pad. So, you know, I applaud them for adding an entire second circuit board just to make the D-pad better because that's more expensive. You know, you're talking two boards, four interconnects. Interconnects are very expensive. So I applaud that. That's which, which is probably why they removed the plugs for the rumble pads because they had to save money someplace all right, so here are the analog triggers on the Xbox 360. Uh, most generic controllers use the same configuration as does the Xbox One. So what happens is when you push this spring-loaded trigger, it rotates this potentiometer a little bit, and then the potentiometers are mirrored of each other. They work the same way, except for they have different values. So if you want to move the analog triggers on the Xbox 360, you have to remove the entire plastic assembly and keep it intact. What we used to do is we would take these and put them over on the other side so you'd have access to both of them with one hand. Okay, so I put some hot glue around the potentiometer and then removed it and now it's held in place. Is there nothing hot glue can't do? So as far as rewiring this, it's pretty straightforward. One thing to note is not all of the vias are plated on both sides. See how these are plated here, but they're not plated on this side and vice versa. So we actually have to run ribbon cable through the holes and solder them on this side in order to make the contact. You also need to be a lot more careful with single-sided plated vias. 
because there won't be through hole plating on that. And the problem with that is without the through hole plating, the, the pad won't be held down as well. So these pads will be much more susceptible to lifting and damage than a via that's double sided will be because without the metal running through the circuit board, there's less to hold the metal pad in place. So just be very careful when you solder those. Only solder them as many times as you need to, minimal soldering because the heat will eventually cause the glue to fail and the pad will lift up and possibly break. So yes, always be careful with single-sided or plated only on one side vias. So we need to get this wire out to this. So I am going to, first of all, just like before, cut it to the minimal length, but the minimal folded length. So let's make a little mark with my fingernail, which is why I never cut them too short, also because blood. So I wanna make sure I reference this and wire it the same way it was connected in the same order. But yeah, I mean, this is pretty simple. I mean, really you're just moving a component. So it's really the most straightforward of any of the controller mods. Although when I show you the analog sticks on the Xbox One controller, those are a little trickier, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, let's test if this works. Okay, I'm gonna test the Xbox 360 controller. We put both of the triggers on the same side for accessibility purposes, or you know, you might wanna do it for whatever reason. Okay, there's the normal trigger. All right, so yeah, these are both actually on the same axis, see the Z axis. So one goes up and one goes down. They actually changed that on the Xbox One. All right, they both work. All right, that just leaves the Xbox One's Hall Effect Sensor analog triggers. The final component we're going to talk about changing is the Hall Effect Sensor on the Xbox One controller, and it's also found on the Dreamcast. It's this little integrated circuit right here. So again, you have power, ground, and then sense. And it's going to output an analog value. How it works is when the trigger is pulled, the magnet on the trigger gets closer or further from the Hall Effect Sensor, creating an analog value. So a little circuit like this might seem like it's difficult to solder, but it is possible. I will show you how. First, I'm gonna desolder it. I'm gonna do that just by applying more solder and heat and then pulling it off the circuit board. So I'm just going in and heating the pins in sequence until the part slides away. Okay, the Hall Effect sensor is removed. So let's rewire this. So I'm gonna cut two of these wires shorter and strip just a little bit off like that. Oh yeah! Okay, so I have the first one soldered in place and I want to lay these wires flat against the pad, not stick them down into it. That way, as much of the wire as possible is soldered in place. It'll be more solid that way. So you just tin the wire and you press it in place against the surface mount pad. Ta-da! And once we've verified the connection, I'm going to put, that's right, some hot glue over it to keep it from coming loose. Okay, so this controller has been modified six ways this Sunday, and the last thing that I've done to it is I've ported out the Hall Effect Sensor Integrated Circuit for magnetic field detection. So when I pull the trigger here, I am bringing a magnetic field closer to the sensor, and the other Hall Effect Sensor has been ported out. Now I have a neomidium magnet in my hand here, so when I bring it closer to the Hall Effect Sensor, it should affect the trigger in the other direction. See that? The proximity of the magnet creates the trigger pull. Now this does pose some challenges, uh, mostly in that you have to have a magnet put into some sort of container with linear actuation. Although you could make something like a slide control, you could have a spring and then the magnet could slide back and forth, although you'd run the risk of the wire becoming magnetized. So I guess you'd probably have to use an aluminum spring, although most of them are steel. So see, this could be a problem. All right, so there's your trigger pull based off the proximity of the magnet to the Hall Effect sensor. In this episode, we discussed custom mods for video game controllers. First, we showed you how to move the face buttons around to different locations, such as the back of the controller. Then we explained how analog sticks worked and how those could be modified as well. We talked about the D-pad and we swapped it around with an analog stick as an example. Finally, we talked about analog triggers, both mechanical and Hall Effect sensor. Hopefully these tips will be useful if you want to make your own performance enhancing mods, or if you want to help build a controller for a friend with accessibility needs. What other game system modifications do you think we should cover? Have you ever hacked something to make it easier to use before? Let us know on the Element 14 community where you can also keep track of our upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time.
I won't be happy until a Toy Story movie has them dead in a dump. <laughs> so, do you think Sam Raimi has multiple Delta 88s or if they just keep fixing the same one? What happened to Toad? He croaked. <laughs> 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 seasons greetings. You know, that can really, there's seasons all year long. That could be anything, you know. Like, like spring like greetings. Pepper and... Oh, that's seasoning. Oh, yeah. yeah season. <laughs> but when you put them on something, you're seasoning them. So I'm going to season this pie with seasoning. But then you so build a building. Right. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.